So in this video, we're going to talk about the antiviral drug acyclovir, which you might also sometimes hear referred to as Zovirax. So Zovirax was the initial brand name for acyclovir when it was still on patent, and it is still made. Uh, however, it's lost its patent now, so loads of generic acyclovir is used. It's less frequent that you hear it referred to as Zovirax anymore, but sometimes people still call it that. Now, it's in the class of drugs known as antivirals. So these are drugs used to treat viral infections in contrast to, for instance, antibiotics, which are drugs used to treat bacterial infections and antifungals, which are drugs used to treat fungal infections. So antiviral means it's used to treat a viral infection. And the three main types of viral infection that acyclovir can be used to treat are, are these three viruses here. So HSV1, HSV2, and VZV. So what do these stand for? So HSV1 stands for herpes simplex, written out here, virus 1. HSV2 is then just herpes simplex virus 2. And VZV stands for varicella zoster virus. Now, let's talk through what these viruses cause. So HSV1 and HSV2, these are viruses that primarily infect the skin, but they can also infect mucosal surfaces, so they can infect the inside of the mouth, so the lips and the buccal mucosa, which is the uh, surface of the inside of your mouth. So if you put your finger in your mouth and rub against the inside of your cheek, that's your buccal mucosa. So herpes simplex viruses 1 and 2 can infect that tissue, the buccal mucosa. They can also infect the lips. They can also infect the genital mucosae, so the lining of the inside of the foreskin on males and the glands portion of the penis uh, and the uh, external vulva mucosae in females. So I've got some pictures here, not of genital infections, but of skin infections. This I just went on uh, Google and typed in herpetic skin infections, and these pictures quite nicely show you what HSV1 and HSV2 can cause. So here is an infection that is sort of affecting this portion of skin just above the lip and then the lip here. And this is the sort of classical appearance of what you see. Uh, it forms like blisters where the infection is actually taking place. You've got like a sort of blister, tiny little blisters that we call vesicles. So vesicular rash, we would describe this as a focal vesicular rash. Uh, let's zoom out and have a look at some of the others. So here again, it's less obvious here that these are vesicles, but they are. So um, these sort of little circular or spherical um, rotund bits. These are tiny little vesicles and then you've sort of got surrounding indurated red portions of skin. So all of this skin is infected with the herpes simplex virus. This is more uh, easy to recognize. Here you can clearly see that it's formed little tiny blisters, these vesicles. So all of this area of skin is infected with uh, HSV. Now, classically, we're taught that HSV1 usually infects the skin or the lips or the uh, buccal mucosae, and HSV2 is more the one that infects the genitals, but the reality is both can infect either region. I haven't got pictures of genital infections uh, here for obvious reasons, but um, it looks effectively the same, but on the genitals. How is it spread? It's spread by contact. So if one person is infected with HSV uh, somewhere and then that area touches someone else, then the virus will go onto their skin uh, or potentially through kissing. If someone, for instance, has this on their lip or in the inside of their buccal mucosa and then they kiss someone else, uh, then the virus can be spread to that person and they can get lip or buccal mucosa infections as well. And often in the mouth, these blisters then uh, often ulcerate, so you get mouth ulcers, lots of mouth ulcers all at once. That's suspicious for herpes simplex. Now, of course, people get mouth ulcers for other reasons as well. If you've got a mouth ulcer, it doesn't mean you've necessarily got a herpes infection. So all sorts of uh, irritant chemicals that you might put in your mouth for dental hygiene reasons. If, you know, if you go a bit overboard maybe with the mouthwash and you go really intense, then that can irritate the buccal mucosa and cause ulcerations or blisters and then ulcerations. So mouth ulcers or mouth sores don't necessarily mean herpes, but if you get loads all at once, that can be a herpetic infection. And of course, you don't need to necessarily have contact with the actual place where the infection is. So for instance, let's say someone has this 
infection on a part of their skin that isn't exposed, let's say maybe their abdomen, um, but they've touched it with their hands and then not washed their hands, and then if you touch that person's hands, you can then get it on your hands, and then you might touch your hands to maybe your face, and then the virus might be on your facial skin and you might get an outbreak on your facial skin. So it's, it, the virus is spread by contact. Um, so the area that is infected will have lots of virus on it and then that virus can be picked up by other surfaces that come into contact with it and then spread to other people. And if it gets onto your skin, you might then get an infection there. And indeed, someone who has got a hepatic skin infection, if they touch this and then touch other parts of their skin, they might spread the infection to their other parts of the skin. Now, similarly, with genital hepatic infections, it often spreads through genital contacts. It's often considered a sexually transmitted disease. Hepatic infections, HSV1 and HSV2, they usually do self-resolve. Um, so if you do absolutely nothing, if you don't treat them, with, for example, a cyclovir, it usually does get better by itself. Uh, but a cyclovir is an option for treating really severe hepatic infections that are taking a long time to get uh, to go away. Uh, and it does repeat, uh, it does make the uh, improvement, the resolution quicker. So HSV1 and HSV2, they can cause these skin and mucosal infections, some pictures of which I've shown you here. But another thing that they can cause that is far more serious is a condition called encephalitis. Now, encephalon is from some old language, either Greek or Latin, I think it's Greek, um, means brain. So encephalitis is inflammation of the brain. So these two viruses can sometimes spread, potentially starting off as skin infections, but they can spread into the blood, cause an infection of the blood, a viremia, and then they can go to other parts of the body. And one of the places they can end up is within the brain and they can set up an infection there. And that's called encephalitis. And we will call that a hepatic encephalitis. And this is very, very serious when this happens. It can massively reduce someone's cognitive state so they can become completely obtunded. They can go into a complete drowsy state where they might not be responsive at all, a comatose state. Um, and sometimes, I've never seen, in all honesty, in my clinical career, a proven case of viral encephalitis. I think it might be quite difficult to actually prove it. Uh, it might require a brain biopsy, for instance, which is something that we don't usually do to patients. But sometimes when people come in, often elderly people, and they've suddenly become comatose and no one knows why they're comatose and we scream for other types of infections that might do it because sometimes infections in the bladder or infections in the chest can put people into a comatose state we call it a hypoactive delirium um, so let's say we've screened their chest we don't think they've got a chest infection we've screened their urine we've also looked all over their skin for cellulitis we haven't found anything we haven't found infections anywhere else but for some reason they're completely obtunded Sometimes in those situations, we do empirically treat potentially for viral encephalitis and we give a cyclovir, we give intravenous a cyclovir. Um, often, in my experience, these people who get put on intravenous a cyclovir for query viral encephalitis, it turns out it wasn't. They end up having an MRI scan of their brain because initially they'll have a CT scan of their brain because that's quick uh, and we can get that quickly um, when they come in and that might turn out to be completely normal. Uh, so we then put them on the intravenous acyclovir and then whilst we're waiting to get an MRI scan and then the MRI scan often finds the reason that they're confused, that maybe they've got a phalamic stroke or something like that. Um, but I do see people put on the intravenous acyclovir in case they've got viral encephalitis when they're either really confused and it's all of a sudden and no one knows why they've become really confused or they've gone into a comatose state and no one knows why. And it was, you know, they were fine one day and now suddenly they're in a comatose state. Sometimes we do put them on intravenous acyclovir. But as I say, I've never seen a case where it's actually ever been proven. And usually I've seen cases where they end up having an MRI scan and it finds out why that person is confused and it wasn't hepatic encephalitis. But be aware that this is something that can happen and we do look for it clinically and sometimes initiate empirical treatment for it.
Finally, another thing to be aware of that herpes simplex viruses can infect is the eyes, and this is called herpetic keratitis. So keratitis means inflammation of the cornea. So I've got some pictures here, so I've just typed in Google herpetic keratitis. Now, these are pictures of people's eyes that are infected with herpes simplex virus. Now, they've had some sort of chemical put into their eyes, a special eye drop to make it visible. This is a fantastic one. So here we have an eyeball and just a brief bit of anatomy. Obviously, you've got the pupil in the center there. You've got the iris here, the colored part of the eye. And then you've got this sort of dome structure over the top, which is the cornea. Then you've got the white of the eye, which is the sclera, which will be covered by a thin translucent membrane that is the conjunctiva. So you've got two uh, transparent membranes. The I said translucent before, I meant transparent for the conjunctiva as well. So you've got the cornea here that goes over the top of the iris and the pupil, which is a hole through which light goes through, uh, which is a transparent membrane. And then you've got the conjunctiva, which is a transparent membrane over the top of the whites of the eyes. So conjunctivitis means inflammation of the conjunctiva, and that makes everything appear pink. All this, the white of the eye turns pink, and that's pink eye. Keratitis is much less common than conjunctivitis, um, and is much more serious, and is inflammation of the cornea here. And herpes simplex horribly can infect this cornea, and someone has put this special chemical into this person's eye that is infected with herpes, and you can see the areas that are infected with the herpes here. Uh, on some of these other ones, these, these bits here are infected with herpes. There's another great picture down here where all of these bits that are showing up bright green are the herpes infections. So horrible. How, of course, does it get there? Well, it gets on someone's hands and then they touch their eyes and it can get into there. And then if you're very unlucky, it can set up an infection there. Uh, so this is not a nice condition at all. It can obviously massively damage your sight because if your cornea gets damaged, it can end up losing its transparency and that can actually ultimately make you blind if it gets bad enough and you can end up having to have a corneal transplant where your cornea is removed and uh, another one is surgically put in. Uh, or, or, well, you don't necessarily have to have that surgery. You can accept the blindness, but that's something that can be surgically done to fix that. But after that has happened, obviously, if the cornea is ruined and you've lost vision, there's no tablet that's going to fix that. It's something that can only be fixed surgically. So a horrible uh, type of infection that herpes simplex can cause. And people who have had this... Um, they are definitely treated with acyclovir and often they are kept on acyclovir for a very, very long time, potentially indefinitely, to keep the viral infection suppressed uh, because often if they come off it, it might come back. So the cornea, often it's very difficult for viral infections that have established there to be cleared because it has very poor blood supplies, it's very difficult for the immune system to clear infections in the cornea. In contrast to these other places where the infections can occur, if you get it in the skin or mucosal infections or uh, genital infections, as I say, normally if you do nothing, even if you don't treat with a cycle there, it usually does self-resolve. Encephalitis, either it will lead to death ultimately or it will eventually resolve and the person hopefully will get better. But keratitis often it's a chronic infection. The body finds it very difficult to clear that infection so these people often end up on indefinite acyclovir that sort of keeps the infection under control but if they were to be taken off the acyclovir it might come back uh, and cause symptomatic issues again.